Welcome to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. We have a heart to see awakening in America. Here's Pastor with today's teaching. Good morning and God's blessings to every one of you. A blessed Christmas and I wish you a, and a remarkable and amazing new year. Today we're going to be taking a look at one of the most pleasant, uplifting, and encouraging accounts found anywhere in the scriptures. It is only recorded by Luke the Evangelist. All the evidence that we have suggests that Luke got this event and the description of it directly from Mary herself. One of my favorite hymns, Christmas hymns, is O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. And what we're going to see today in Luke chapter 2 is Emmanuel coming to Israel, revealing himself, and God's prophets declaring and acknowledging him for whom he really is. Before we take a look at the scriptures together today, would you join me in a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we bless and praise you. We honor you because you are the God of the universe, and yet you are so close to each and every one of us. We thank you that we can speak to you in prayer and know that you not only hear, but you listen. You understand the deepest needs. You understand the cries of our hearts. And so we come before you today, Father, asking that you would enlighten our minds and our very spirits. May we know you better. May we follow you more faithfully. May we see Jesus more clearly. And may we understand the remarkable time in which you have placed us. In these last days, may we bear witness to you and testify to the mighty things that you have done through Jesus, our Savior, our risen King, and our returning Lord. Amen. Well, I would invite you this morning to open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. I'd like to begin at verse 21, where we read these words, powerful words in the Scripture. It says, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. You know, the name Jesus is so widely understood, used, and known But many times we don't fully comprehend what the name itself means. The Hebrew is Yeshua or Yehoshua. It literally means Yehovah, Jehovah, Yahweh saves, God saves. That's the name that was given to Jesus. And it is indeed a precious name. Not only is it his given name, the name the angel gave. The angel told that to Mary. And I might add, if you read the Gospel of Matthew, you will notice that in a dream, the angel spoke to Joseph and gave him the same name as well. God saves a powerful name, a mighty name, a remarkable name. And it is the name that blesses all who call upon him. There's a great hymn written by a well-known hymn writer, John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. Newton wrote a number of hymns. One of them, not as well known as Amazing Grace, but speaks about the name of Jesus. It goes like this. How sweet the name of Jesus sounds in a believer's ear. It soothes our sorrows, heals our wounds, and drives away all fear. The name that was given by the angel is the name that declares God is the one who saves us. And every time we speak the name of Jesus... We are reminded of that truth, that God saves, that God has broken into our world, that God has stepped in to do what we cannot do. There is no way you or I or any other human being can save ourselves. We human beings tend to think we are self-sufficient, but the fact is we are not. And when it comes to things spiritual, when it comes to our relationship with God, we need nothing short of divine intervention. The name of Jesus He is the one who saves, and he reminds us that God saves us through him. That's the name the angel gave him. We continue on then, verse 22. It says, When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And then it goes on in the following verse, verse 23 and verse 24. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. 
Now, very often we tend to just read over those words and move on and say, well, when we get to the rest of the story. But these words are a very important part of the story. And here is what they tell us. They tell us that Jesus obeyed all the law of the Lord, the law of Moses, the Torah that was written down by Moses over 1400 years earlier. Jesus obeyed all of that. And his parents saw to it that he was raised as a devout Israelite, a faithful Jewish young man. Here in these verses of Luke chapter 2, we see three very important aspects of obeying that law that Moses had given the children of Israel. We see circumcision, dedication, and purification. And I'd like to pause for just a second to refer and reflect on each one of those because they are very significant and they often get overlooked. First of all, circumcision was to be done on the eighth day of a boy baby's life. It was a sign of the covenant, a sign that this child was set apart for God. And in the case of Jesus, he was circumcised on the eighth day, just as the scriptures declare. But then we are also told that he was taken by his parents to Jerusalem, where he was dedicated. That dedication was to take place a month after the child was born. It was the dedication of the firstborn. It is something that is mentioned in the book of Numbers, chapter 18, where the Israelites were told that every firstborn child, every firstborn male, was to be dedicated to the Lord, to be given wholly to him. That was known as, in Hebrew, as the Pidyon Haben, the dedication of the firstborn. Five shekels of silver were to be paid at that time as the firstborn was ransomed because it was God who redeemed us and God who saved us, God who spared the firstborn in Egypt when the firstborn of Egypt died, but the Israelite children were saved. Every firstborn child is holy to the Lord. And so Jesus underwent the Pidyon Haben. I might add, I'm one of the few pastors, I believe, who has actually witnessed firsthand an actual Pidyon Haben, a dedication of the firstborn. It happened in all places, Jerusalem. Both Jan and I had been invited by a dear friend of mine, my earliest and best friend. We had gotten reacquainted about 50 years after we last saw one another. My friend had invited me to uh, witness a Pidyon Haben in his backyard. He is a Orthodox rabbi and a rabbinic judge, and it was fascinating to see that ancient biblical ritual enacted in front of our very eyes. That is what Jesus underwent at the age of about a month, the Pidyon Haben, the dedication. And then finally, purification is mentioned here. That purification was for Mary and also for Joseph in a sense, because they were together as the baby was born. But the purification involved the mother being rededicated to the Lord and purified to serve him. That happened 33 days after the circumcision of Jesus. And so on about the 40th day of Jesus' life, Mary and Joseph remained in Jerusalem and Mary underwent that purification. That is described very clearly here in the Gospel of Luke. And it's a reminder that Jesus fulfilled everything the Hebrew scripture said and predicted. And so it is now in the temple courts where the Israelites would gather daily for worship and praise of God. It is here now that the following events take place. And Luke records them for us in a remarkable way. We read in verse 25. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. Don't you wonder what that looked like? As Jesus is brought into the temple courts, over a month old now, 
His parents bring him to dedicate him to the Lord and come and remain there so that Mary may undergo her purification. And all of a sudden, out of the crowd of worshipers, appears this man, Simeon. He is described as being righteous and devout, a dedicated Israelite. He is full of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has revealed to him that he will not die before he sees the promised Messiah. What was it like on that day as Simeon, prompted by the Holy Spirit, was led to go up to this young couple and take the baby in his arms and say, Lord, I thank and praise you that you have kept your promise to me. I have gotten to see the Messiah. Here is what Simeon said at that point. These are words known as the nunc dimittis. That's Latin for now dismiss me, Lord. He says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Simeon recognized that he was holding in his arms the very Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one of God, who would not only bring hope and joy and restoration to Israel, but would also bring the nations to a knowledge of the living God. Simeon rejoiced that day because he saw God's promise fulfilled before his very eyes as he held the child in his arms. Sovereign Lord, Now dismiss your servant in peace. In other words, I am ready to die because I have seen the promises of the prophets fulfilled. I have seen the predictions of the living God coming to life. We are told then by Luke, the child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. But then we read this, verse 34. Then Simeon blessed them. And said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. Along with the good news, there also comes a word of warning. And the warning is that although God is fulfilling everything he has promised, it comes at a great cost. And many will not receive what God so graciously offers. What we see here in the early days of Jesus' life is a prophetic word that speaks about the latter years of his ministry. Jesus will grow in favor with God and men. But when he begins his ministry, there will be a line in the sand, a division that will occur. Many individuals will not receive what he has to offer. You know, the same thing is true today. There are many who do not want to admit their need. There are many who do not want to receive what God so graciously offers. We human beings are prideful lot. And many times we are kept from acknowledging God's goodness by our own self-centeredness, our own pride, and our own arrogance. When Jesus came, he came to people some of whom were ready to receive him because they knew how desperate they were. But many others were prideful and full of themselves, and they would not accept what he had to offer. Simeon, early in the child's life when he is still a babe in arms, lets Mary and Joseph know what lies ahead. This child will cause the fall and rising of many in Israel. Many Israelites will believe him, but many others will not. And so we are not surprised when we read the rest of the gospel record that tells us that many of the religious leaders and many of the very devout people would not receive Jesus, would not accept what he had to offer. They were proud about their own spiritual accomplishments. They rejoiced in their own strength and they refused to come to him. It's important for us to hear that and to take that to heart. It is important for us to make sure that our hearts are tender and open to receive all that God has to offer in Jesus the Savior. God loves humble people. And God offers to those who are desperate 
life and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. But God opposes the proud. That is the gospel truth. We read on. Simeon speaks now to Mary, his mother, and he says the following, And a sword will pierce your own soul, too. Aren't those powerful and tragic words? And they are words that were also fulfilled, prophetic words that were truly fulfilled in the life of Mary. The woman who said all people will call her blessed would also experience unbelievable sorrow and incredible grief. She would watch her son die on a cross. She would see him rejected by others. And Simeon gives her, in effect, a heads up, letting her know what is to come. Even in that powerful prophetic word that is so painful, we see the grace and mercy of God. God reminds his children that difficult days will face us in these last times. The scriptures make it very clear for all of us who follow the Lord Jesus that we will go through times of trial and difficulty. In fact, the Apostle Paul would say, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. We should not be surprised when painful times come. What we should do is look to him. Look to him who loves us and who will redeem us. Him who will achieve the final victory at the very end of days. Here Simeon gives a word of warning to Mary. And it is a gracious warning that will give her comfort when the days of heart-piercing pain arrive. She will live to see Jesus' death but she will also be there to witness his resurrection. And the last time we see her appearing in the pages of the New Testament scriptures is also recorded by Luke the Evangelist. He writes about it in the book of Acts when he says, after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, Mary was there with the others, worshiping and praying and praising God for the mighty things that he had done. Well, this in and of itself would be a tremendous story but it's not where the story ends. Instead, we see something else incredibly remarkable happening. This is what we read in the Gospel of Luke, beginning at verse 36. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. I might add, you can also translate that, and I believe there is good cause for translating this way. You can also translate that she lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow for 84 years. Keep in mind, Jewish young ladies were married very early in their teens, usually around 13 or 14 years of age. That would mean, if we take these words as they can be translated, that Anna was about 105 years old at this point. She was very old. Her name is also remarkable. Although in English it's translated Anna, in Hebrew it's Hana, or in Greek, Hana. It means mercy. It is the name of the mother of the boy Samuel. It is a name that reminds us of the mercy of God. And now here comes this aged lady, and she comes at the very time that Simeon has taken the baby in his arms, praised God, and then spoken prophetic words over him. What is the chance of that happening? With God, there are no accidents. There are no coincidences. Here is another godly woman who is described specifically as a prophet. And the Holy Spirit points her at the same time to move through all the crowd of worshipers who have gathered in the temple courts and head directly for this one young couple and this one baby boy who is now being held in the arms of a man who says, Lord, I'm ready to come home because I have seen the one that you have prepared for all the nations, not just the children of Israel, but for all the nations. We then sit back and just stand in awe of God. And here is what we are told in the scriptures. Verse 37, 
Anna never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. What a glorious day it was. All of God's promises were being fulfilled. You realize, of course, don't you, that this is not simply an account of what happened long ago. Don't get me wrong. This really happened long ago. And this is a faithful and accurate account. But it is also an indication of what is to come. Because you see, for centuries, God's people longed for the fulfilling of the promise that he had made to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to Moses, to the prophets. And then finally, after hundreds, after 2,000 years, Jesus came. Today, there are many people who are longing for his second appearing. And for generations, believers have yearned for the day of the Lord, the day when Christ will return, when all things will be made right, when there will be a new heaven and a new earth, when the Lord Jesus will reign over all. Do you realize it's coming? And there will be a day when you and I, like Simeon and Anna, will behold the one whom the Father has promised all along, and we will say the day has arrived, and we will rejoice, not just on that day, we will rejoice forever. That is what God offers, and that is at the heart of the story Luke relates here. This is not merely a story about what happened with Jesus in the early days of his life. This is a powerful reminder that God keeps his word, and no word from God will ever fail. He will deliver what he has promised. And that means that you and I in our lives can trust that he will deliver everything he has promised us. That is why it is so important to receive him as Savior and Lord. It's why it is so important to live in his presence, to live in a relationship with him through faith. That is why it is so important to give praise and honor to God every day, to not fall into the trap of merely living life on our own terms, but rather to live life by faith on the terms that God himself has established, to be people wholly committed to him. If you've wandered from him, these are words that call you to come back to him. If you've never given your heart to him, these are words that invite you to graciously receive what God seeks to offer. Do not settle for spiritual duct tape and spiritual WD-40. Instead, take the real thing, the Lord Jesus Christ, who brings healing and forgiveness and life and joy and peace and offers it to all who call upon him. And if you believe in him, then let's celebrate together. And let's rejoice that he keeps his word and that just as Anna and Simeon saw the Lord Jesus face to face, the day is coming when you and I will see him as well. I don't know if I will live long enough to witness firsthand the second coming of Christ. I do know this. When he comes back, if I have already died and gone to be with the Lord, I am going to be raised, and none of us are going to miss it. We will all behold him, and we will see him in his full glory when he returns. And that, that will be a day of endless rejoicing that will never end. Luke tells us the following. Verse 39. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. His name is Jesus. God saves, and what a salvation it is. Amen. 
You've been listening to Awake Us Now with Pastor Chris Dodge. Our program is sponsored by Awake Us Now. Have questions about today's message? Text or call us at 612-545-5654 or email us at mail at awakeusnow.com. And join us again next time. For-